Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Hello. So we're here today with Mark and Barbara Hi. for today's Hello. Sabbath school lesson, Jesus, the giver of rest. But before we begin, who's the most important person we need for Sabbath school? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So Barbara, if you could open us in prayer. I'd love to. Thank you. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we need your rest. We need your peace. And so we pray today as we delve into your word that you will show us your rest, that we will be filled with your spirit, that we'll be filled with your love, and that we'll be filled with the knowledge of what you would have us to learn. So thank you for being with us and guide each of our lips today that your word only is spoken. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... We're going to start off with the memory verse today, Hebrews 4, 9. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That's our memory verse, as we said. And if you read it in the King James Version, it doesn't actually have the word Sabbath in it. So I actually like this, this version a little bit better. And you might ask why I say that. Because in the original Greek, in the Koine Greek, that Sabbath rest is the Greek word sabbatismos, and that is the only time that word occurs in the New Testament. Paul did that for a reason. Now, if you, there is a version of the Old Testament called um, the Septuagint, and that word is that Greek word is actually used seven times in there, but each time it refers to Sabbath as well. Once for the seventh day Sabbath, once for um, other Sabbaths, and five times for the resting in a sabbatical year. So Paul intentionally did this to indicate that that is the, the seventh day Sabbath. So we're gonna dig into that and see the rest that only Jesus can give us. But before we do that, let's read verse 10 that follows because the two actually go together. So I'm going to read 9 first again. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In verse 10, for the one who has entered his, and that's God's rest, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now we see that word rested in there, for he himself also rested from his works. And that word is katapao in Greek, and it's a verb in a tense called aorist. And really, we don't see that in English, but what that means is it was continually happening. So a good example in Jesus in Matthew 4, 1, when it says that he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, that verb tempted is a tense of aorist, which means that he was tempted those 40 days continually. So if we read, read verse 10 correctly, it would say, for the one who has entered his, that's God's rest, has himself also continually rested from his works, as God did in his. And we see that in verse 410, as God did from his. What are they talking about? To go there, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And that reads, thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. And in verse 2, that he rested on the seventh day is a direct correlation to what Paul is referring to here. So what is this rest that Jesus wants to give us? This rest that on that first Sabbath, Adam and Eve enjoyed with God. It's, it's a rest that was true at creation. It's a rest that was true during the time of Moses that God wanted to offer us. It was a, time, a rest that was present at the time of Jesus and the apostles. And it's a rest that we have available to us today. Now, I don't know what the first Sabbath looked like with Jesus and God, literally, and Adam and Eve and that perfection. 
but we see glimpses of it in the New Testament periodically. And I'm going to read Acts 16, verses 23 through 25. And this about, is about Paul and Silas being in prison. When they had struck them, and they're in Philippi, by the way, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Truly, that peace, that rest, you have to have it for that to occur. I can't see any other possibility. And we know from Scripture what happened after that. There was an earthquake, the doors to the prison opened, and the shackles fell off of all the prisoners. But in verse 25, that, that praising God, considering everything that happened, it was just amazing. That is that rest. And we see in Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses, or other versions say transcends, all comprehension, or other versions say understanding, we see that in action here with Paul and Silas. Paul wrote about this rest because he knew it. He experienced it. He solely depended on God to know it. Now, let me ask you this. Did he ever stumble or fall short? Did he ever lose that rest? Acts 18, 9 through 10. This is Paul at Corinth. And the Lord said to Paul in a night, in a night, by a, or in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Now this gives me hope, because even Paul had his moments where he was afraid, where he didn't boldly profess Christ, Yet he still knew that rest. And he, even if he did stumble, he knew how to come back to that rest in Christ. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Jesus himself says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we exchange our heavy laden burdens for Christ, we can find rest in him. There's so much more that we could talk about. This is just the introduction though. So this week's lesson, we're going to go through some steps and we're going to see what it would take to enter into that rest, that true rest that Jesus offers. I'd like to read one thing very quickly from Christ and the Sabbath by Ellen White, page 14. It is important to notice that our, what was done to this day. The record in the second chapter of Genesis, which we covered, which is the first mention that we have of the Sabbath, says he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. It is apparent at once that the creator of the ends of the earth, who never wearies and who never is faint, did not rest on the first, set, first seventh day because he had wearied himself in the work of creation, said Christ to the woman in Samaria, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God being spirit, his rest must be spiritual rest. And that is the matter of no small importance because we overlook the true idea of the Sabbath when we take it to mean merely a day of physical rest. Who rested on that day? Christ, who was the agent in creation, rested on that day because he was tired? Not in any sense. It was a spiritual rest. He rested and was refreshed. He took delight in viewing the works which he had made. That was the rest. Sabbath means rest. And from the very nature of the institution of the Sabbath, it means spiritual rest. Observe the practical application of that idea. If physical rest is the only idea of the Sabbath, a man can rest on one day just as well as another. 
He can do more. He can divide it up and rest during several days of the week. And he can rest three or four hours each day as may suit him. He must rest rainy days or work sunny days if he pleases, if physical rest is the only idea of Sabbath. We're going to see today why it is a spiritual rest and how we need, desperately need that spiritual rest. So Barbara, if you can tell us about Sunday's lesson and the land as a place of rest. Yes, and we're going to look at the land as a place of rest with the, the children of Israel. And we're going to start by looking at the promise God made to Abraham. And so we see in Genesis 12, um, 1 through 4, that um, the, now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from the family, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make to you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old. So he wasn't very young when he left to, um, to go out, but... <clears throat> So God's purpose in giving the land to Israel was not simply for the people to possess it, but for, but was God was bringing him to himself. Now, it's interesting that God told Abraham, in my opinion, to get up and leave. Why couldn't God have made a great nation for Abraham right where he was? And um, Ellen White explains this very nicely in Patriarchs and Prophets. The message of God came to Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee in order that God may, might qualify him for his great work as a keeper of the sacred oracles. And here's the key. Abraham must be separated from his associations of his early life. The influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servant. Now that Abraham was, and in a special sense, connected with heaven, he must dwell among strangers. His character must be peculiar, differing from all the world. <clears throat> he could not even explain his course of action as to be understood by his friends. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and his motives and actions were not comprehended by his idolatrous kindred. And so literally, to serve God, he had to leave where he was. <clears throat> and sometimes in our lives, when we're in, place, we're, when we're in places where our friendships, our relationships aren't, are harming us, we need to think about that. We need to think about picking up and, and moving to a different place. So then we go on <clears throat> to Genesis 15, 13 through 15. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they, they serve, I will judge. Afterward, I will come out with great possessions. So, and so we see, I'm not going to read all of the rest of those scriptures, but in verse 18, let's jump there. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I, will, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. So when God was delivering Israel from Egypt, he was, he had a, his purpose was to bring them to the land of Canaan, where he would be able, they'd be able to serve and freely obey him. Now, if you remember, when they were in um, Egypt, they weren't able to keep the Sabbath. They weren't even able to serve God. They were working seven days a week. And even when Moses asked them to go, if you recall, Pharaoh got upset and said, okay, I'm just going to make it even more difficult for you. Now I'll give you the straw and you have to make your own bricks. And so <clears throat> this wasn't what God had in mind for his people. He wanted them to be with him where they could be together. He could spend time with them and they could worship together. In Psalms 105, 43 through 45, 
He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the land of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws, including enjoying the Sabbath rest. And so we see that, um, that that is exactly what happened. The land of Canaan was the inheritance that God had promised to Abraham because he obeyed God and left his country to go to the promised land. So God wanted them to have a place of worship. And so we see this worship, this place of worship, in Deuteronomy 12, 8 through 14. And God tells them that the land he is giving them is so that he can build this relationship. So let's read this. You shall not <clears throat> all do as we do here today. So he's saying, man, every man is, is, doing, is not to do what he's currently doing. And because they were doing, as we see, what was right in their own eyes. For yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around about you, so that you will dwell in safety. So you see, he wanted, he didn't want them to live in that constant turmoil. He wanted them to be in a place of safety where they weren't working seven days a week and they could honor him. Then there will be a place there, uh, verse 11, then there will be a place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you will bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord and your sons and your daughters, your male, female servants, and the Levite who is with you within the gates, since he has no portion of inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself. Do not offer burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place that the Lord chooses. In one of your tribes there will, shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. So the Lord told the people that they were entering to rest simply, not by entering the, just by entering the land, but when they purged the land from idolatry. After that, God would show them how to worship. And you have to remember, their worship was different. They, they worshiped the sun. So their, their, everything that they did was around the sun. God did not want that. He didn't want the Sunday to be the special day. He wanted them to be worshiping on the Sabbath. <clears throat> and you see that in when God was, um, one of the first thing God did was give him the Ten Commandments. And we see that in Exodus and again in Deuteronomy to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So there's a couple of things that the Sabbath commemorates. And um, we want to take a look at those. And we'll say this from, I'm going to read this from the Desire of Ages. No other institution which is committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from the surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should disintegrate them disintegrate them as his worshipers. Designate, I'm sorry, not disintegrate. Designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith, they must be partakers of the righteousness of Christ. So God connected the Sabbath creation. He, he honored it again with um, the children of Israel in Egypt. And today he honors us, wants us to honor it with him as well. And I love that because God wanted them to purge the idolatry from the land, just like Abraham had to leave the idolatry behind as well. And we see that, that Exodus refers to the creation Sabbath, mm -hmm. whereas Deuteronomy refers to the um, redemption Sabbath, which luckily we have today as well. So, Mark, yep. can you tell us about Monday because of unbelief? That would be one of those stumbling blocks to rest, huh? That's right. 
So yeah, we're gonna today on this one we're going to um, for this today's lesson we're gonna explore Hebrews and how this idea of rest comes from belief in his promises. Or actually, as the title says, what happens if you don't believe? And I wanted to start it out with something that, that Barbara brought up in Deuteronomy 12.10. And this was when Moses was talking about what would happen when the children of Israel would get into the promised land. And let's just start it out there, just to rephrase 12.10 one more time as Barbara read too. And just to kind of start this lesson, this day's lesson. When you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land in which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety. So clearly he's saying that when, you get, when they get into this promised land, they would be safe. Now in Hebrews, and we're studying Hebrews this, this week, right? It talks, it doesn't talk about that this was given to the children of Israel 40 years after they were in the desert. What happened 40 years before that was a story and what we're going to talk about in Hebrews that talks specifically about what happens when you don't believe in God's promises. And that is that promise that Barbara mentioned about the children of Israel coming into the promised land. And so let's read Hebrews 3 verses 16 and 19. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom he, did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. There it is. Now this, you guys know, this is a story um, it's, a, it's a pretty tough story. It's a story in the Bible of the story of the 12 spies and what we happened at this time, and they're referring to the children of the 12 spies. And Moses had come out with the children, with the Israelites, they've come out of exile from Egypt, and they were within a, just a couple years, maybe a couple months, and they were really close to Canaan. And God told them to send 12 spies into Canaan and investigate the land. And as we read in Numbers 13, verses 27 and 28, this is what they came out with of investigating this, this, this promised land that God said would be theirs. And they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in this land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Onox there. Now that's the, the truth. That was the result. You can see in this stuff that yes, this land is a, is a promised land. It, it, they could imagine themselves there that they could be worshiping the Lord. But they also know that it was filled with a lot of people. There were 12 spies and 10 spies didn't believe God's promise that they could occupy this land, this land that was filled with people. And so they sent us, they editorized this response from the, the facts, as I like to say. And in Numbers 13, verses 32, we listen to what the 10 spies say about these facts. But the men who came, who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. These ten spies didn't believe God's promise that this was going to be their land. But they did have two spies that, that came back and reported a different story. And these are Caleb and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua said, and they spoke to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The Lord we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel, rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are their bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Unfortunately, the children of Israel listened to the ten spies. And they didn't listen to the two. And as a result, 
that's what Hebrews is talking about. They had, the, they had to walk the desert for 40 years. And every one of them did not get to see the promised land except Caleb and Joshua. They got to see the promised land, but those others didn't. And that's what we're reading about in Hebrews 3, verses 16 and 19. But the, what the lesson we hear about this is that in order for us to see, receive rest, like Caleb and Joshua eventually did, and like the people when they went into the promised land, they do, we have to believe in God's promise. The second thing that we, that we need to look at is that this, this God's promises for us, this path that he has for us, he's outlaid for us, is, is going to be a path that only God can provide. It may look impossible. And that's what happened to these 10 spies. They thought it was impossible. But remember, God gives us promises that, that only he can, he, that he can do. Okay, and if I read, um, only he can do. That is, they are based only on grace and accessible only through faith. Going to the promised land, conquering this land and being able to survive was something that only God could do. For us, eternal life. You know, believing in God that he can provide and sacrifice himself for our sins. And we, we bring about this in Hebrews 4, verses 2. If we come back to Hebrews and talk about what Paul said, it says about this fact. And he's referencing, once again, these people, the Israelites that did not believe. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. And these were the children of Israel. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed up, with faith in those who heard it. Because they didn't believe him, they didn't profit from that gift. They didn't get his rest. One last thing I want to say on this section is, the other thing about rest is that we're not alone in our journey or path. Of course, we have God with us every step of the way. But in Hebrews verses 3, verses 12 through 15, it says some, some additional things to obtain our rest. And let's read this. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through deceitfulness of sin. For we, are, ha, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart in the rebellion." So the, what we see here, and I want to read back on verse 13. It says, but exalt one another daily while it is called today. So he doesn't, not only wants us to believe in his promises, trust in God, but he also wants us to help one another along that path. This is not the only place that he says this within Hebrews. In Hebrews 10 verses 24, he mentions it. In Hebrews 12, verses 15, he mentions it. Exhort one another. Help one another out on this path to rest. Finally, our rest comes because of belief in his promises. Or in this case, you know, unbelief causes not being able to reap that rest. The other one is, is that our rest comes by trusting that God's path for us is the best path, even if it looks impossible. Because only God can provide those types of gifts. And thirdly, exalting others to stay true on the path is our, is our journey, is our responsibility as we do that. Thank you. And I like about that, Mark, is exalting others is, but you see the consequences of unbelief yep. and how that can spread people to ruin as well. Exactly. Well, it's just a nice segue, and I love the today part because... Tuesday's lesson, today, if you hear his voice, is where we're going to next go into. So we want to actually read Hebrews 4, verses 4 through 8. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And we actually read that in Genesis 2 previously. And again in the, this passage, they shall not enter my rest. And we know that from the unfaithful lot. Um, therefore, in verse 6, therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them fail to enter because of disobedience. He fixed it, or and actually, just to pause for a moment, did they get the same message back then that we get today? Yeah. Or essentially, yes. It's yeah, the same. Yeah. God's message has always been the same. 
So verse 7, he again fixes on a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, they would not have spoken of another day after that. So why is today so important? I'm going to read Proverbs 27.1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And James 4.13 and 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Just or you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And Matthew 6, 34, Jesus says himself, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Have you ever heard the phrase, yesterday is already gone and tomorrow may never come? Is that in the song? I know you've heard it before. So, we really have today, here and now. What choices are you, are we even for that matter, gonna make today, this very day? We make choices every day, every minute of the day, but are we choosing God? Are we choosing a new life in Christ Jesus, or is the old man, that former self, still ruling? Basically choosing the world and the things that it offers, or simply choosing self. But we never do that. So I want to read Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now you might say, that's just a story in the Bible, right? I have time. I've done it myself. Oh, I'll do it one later on. But you know, I'm on these prayer calls during the week, and we hear petitions for prayer, and we've had a lot of them, not lately, not for people to be healed, but praying for the families that have lost people. And some of them are, have been taking time and they've been anticipated, but, and they're prolonged over a period, but sometimes it's without warning. One person, family that we prayed for, their brother had a hole in their heart and died suddenly and unexpected, uh, unexpected and I think it's an atrial septal defect. Nur yeah, the nurse knows. And they never knew about it until the day he died. <coughs> now, this is just, I'm sorry. No. Oh. So don't just, <coughs> excuse me, don't just dismiss it. Today is very real. And only God knows when your soul will be required of you. It's, it's a very real fact of life. So now we've covered that part. Let's go to the, the part that's a little more reassuring. The things that actually can happen from embracing that word. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. How God takes care of our needs. This is the rest that we can find. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need all, <coughs> excuse me, need all these things. But seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. First Peter 2.9 talks about how we're a royal priesthood, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Romans 8, 16 through 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. If, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. These are all good things that if you accept that rest in Christ from Jesus, all these things come with it. Jesus paid an incredible price for our salvation to offer us all the blessings and inheritance as heirs that we just read and so much more. But he'll never force you to take it. It all starts with the choice. If you choose Jesus, he has, and I want to read Hebrews 2.14 he has defeated the enemy. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He's rendered the devil and death powerless with him. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I love that. Not only is Christ petitioning for us, he closed that gap so that we could actually approach God once again. He reestablished us. These are all the things and so many more that come when you accept that rest that Christ offers. And he is working to give it to you and to sustain that in you. So I ask you, won't you hear his voice today, this day? and choose Jesus and all that he offers. Barbara, can you tell us about entering into his rest? Entering into his rest. We all need rest, don't we? Oh, spiritual <laughs> rest. Well, sometimes physical rest as well. <laughs> I, I've talked to so many people recently who have not been well, and they're going, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I need rest. So, but we all need, our, we need rest. So, Let's start um, with Hebrews uh, 3, 11, and 4, 1, 3, 5, and 10. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So in anger, God said, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For we who have believed... Do not enter into the rest, as he said. I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his work as God did from his work. So I, I thought about this for a while and did a little bit of searching, and I want to read something from Ellen White because this really explains it nicely, I think. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. Your hope is not in yourself, it is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength, your ignorance to his wisdom, your frailty to his enduring might. We should not make self the center of indulgence, anxiety, and fear as to whether we shall be saved. As this turns our soul away from the Savior of our strength, 
the keeping of our soul to God and trust in him. Talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in him. Put away doubt, dismiss fears. Say with apostolic, as the apostle Paul, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Rest in God. He is able to keep you what have committed him, to which he's committed. If you leave yourself in his hands, he will bring you off more than conquer through him who has loved you. And so we see that, that our life in Christ should be a, a life of rest. So we see also in the Sabbath commandments that we talked about, we've read, we've talked about Exodus 20 and Exodus 5, or Deuteronomy 5, where we see that Moses um, invited us to remember what God has done. We have seen what God wrote on the tablets of stone to finish uh, his work of creation. And then in, in Exodus, we see that God is helping Moses with rest. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting how he, he's helping him with this rest. In, uh, in Exodus 31, 18 and 34, 28, and he made an end of speaking to him on the Mount Sinai. He gave Moses two tablets of stone with, written with the finger of God. So when he was there, though, he was there 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He wrote on the tablets of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And so God was sustaining him here. He had just fought a mighty battle with Pharaoh bringing the children out of Egypt. So this was not only God instructing him, but it was a time of rest as well. And it was also a time of preparation because, as you see, he didn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights. What, what, who else didn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights before their ministry? Jeez. Jesus. So we see that it, he's helping him. So in Deuteronomy, Israel is commanded to keep the Sabbath in view of God's finished work. Of deliverance from bondage. Um, so we're doubly blessed by the Sabbath in the fact that it is especially special, meaningful for us today. And we can see what we're called to do in Hebrews 4, 9 through 11 and 16. There remains therefore a rest for God's people. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time, time of need. So the Sabbath rest celebrates the fact that God ended his work in the work of creation. And Byron read that, Genesis 2, 1 through 3, where God rested after his, um, his creation work. So, then God reaffirms again with Israel after he brings them out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. And we also see that um, in, in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Hebrews uh, 10, 12 through 14 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, awaiting till his enemies made him his footstool. For by one offering, he was perfected forever who are being sanctified. So we notice that God's only rest, and I think this is a critical, critical piece. When we're, when we're, in, we're in, in need, God is working. He's not resting. And so we notice that God rests only when he has secured the well-being, our well-being. The creation, huh? isn't that amazing? The creation, after creation, God rested. Later on, God rested in the temple only after his conquest of the land he had promised Abraham and completed the victories for David in Israel. So you see that, and that should be for us too. We need to be working for God when the, when the time is ripe and resting when he gives us that time to rest. We see that 
Um, even in uh, 1 Kings, when Solomon reigned over the river and over the borders, and they brought tribute and served Solomon all of his days. We see, we see that in, in, in 1 Kings. But what had happened is David had fought the battles before him. So David fought the battles, and at a time of peace, they were able to build a temple, and Solomon, the, the land was able to have rest and prosperity. Um, so we see that in 1 Kings and Exodus. We see the Song of Miriam, where Miriam had... Um, was, was praising God for um, what he had done and bringing them through the sea and saving them and bringing them into a place where they weren't having to run anymore. So they had that rest. Then um, Deuteronomy, it says, every place, Deuteronomy 11.24, every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours from the wilderness to Lebanon. So God keeps his promises and he, he gives them rest in the land. I want to go back to David a minute because David really struggled with a lot of, I mean, he had a lot of conquests. If you look at, at 2 Samuel, it talks about his, his attacks on the Philistine and then Moab and then he defeated uh, Hadadazar and then he took chariots and horsemen and foot soldiers and hamstrung them and with the Syrians and, and it just goes on and on and on everything that had, had happened with David, which ultimately led them into owning the land and being able to have peace. And we too can have this ultimate rest. And I just want to read one more thing from Ellen White. Long have we waited for our Savior's return, but nonetheless is the sure promise. Soon we will be in our promised home. Jesus will lead us beside the living stream from the throne of God and it will explain to us the dark providences through which the earth that he has brought us in order to perfect our characters. There we shall behold with undimmed vision the beauties of Eden restored. And so I'm looking forward to that day Amen. where we can have rest after our battles here. Eternal rest. Eternal rest, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mark, can you tell us about Thursday, a foretaste of new creation, that right. eternal rest? You know, yes. I want to I talk about a couple things um, dealing with the foretaste of new creation. One is I want to revisit this idea that Byron brought up at the very beginning and that rest is spiritual, not just physical. Another thing is, is that we're going to learn that through Hebrews, we're going to see that rest is intentional. And the other one is, is that this rest is one of the greatest examples of being saved by grace through belief in Jesus Christ. You know, when we look at the kind of the, the, the Old Testament or throughout the Bible at the fourth commandment, okay, and we've read a few of them already. We read Exodus 20 uh, talking about um, the fourth commandment and keeping the Sabbath day. And then we read Deuteronomy 5, um, chapter 5, talking about the same thing. Hebrews also says very much the same thing. But before we get to Hebrews, what I want to revisit is Exodus 20 and Exodus Deuteronomy. And kind of pair those off. Barbara mentioned it earlier, but I want to pair those off and see what they are talking about with regards to the, the creation. Let's read through Exodus 20, 8 through 11. And I'm going to remember the Sabbath day, but what I want to focus in on here is the very, very end of this section of the fourth commandment. It says, of the fourth commandment, it says, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So what he did here is he's showing us that we do the Sabbath rest to celebrate his creation. Now, if we go over to Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15, it says very much the same thing, except the last sentence is different. And it says right here, in, in verse 15, if you bring that up, it says, in Deuteronomy 5, verses 15, it says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you the Sabbath day. In this case, he's saying that remember the Sabbath as 
a, a place of when we were redempt, when the children of Israel were, were saved from Egypt. And we can do the same thing because we can remember the Sabbath because Jesus Christ died on that cross for our sins. Now let's go to Hebrews. And we've talked about that with as it creates, you know, we see that Sabbath rest has a new creation, redemption. But in Hebrews 4, verses 8 through 11, we've already read these already, but let's read them again and see how it's different in this version of talking about rest. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter his rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Sabbath points to God's gift of creation and our redemption. And our future rest is with God. And you can clearly see this, our future rest is with God, in verses 9 and 10. It says right there, therefore, therefore, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It's a future tense. For he has entered his rest, also ceased from his curse from his. And this is the case. It's different than the other versions of talking about the Sabbath. In this, he's talking about the future. Now, what is that future? Those are future Sabbaths. But we'll also talk about it's even more than that. So one of the things about this, when we do this rest, and I wanted to bring up uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, early writers of our Seventh-day Adventist church, William Prescott, in Christ and the Sabbath, talking about um, actually the same thing that Bar- Byron talked about, and that is that rest is spiritual, not physical. And it's a little bit more of what uh, Byron mentioned early on. It is true that in a genuine Sabbath keeping, there will be an entire sensation from unnecessary physical work, but that is not in itself Sabbath keeping. The reason why we cease from labor on the seventh day, the Sabbath of our Lord Jesus Christ, is that we are at liberty to contemplate God as manifest to us in Jesus Christ. And the resting from physical labor is an outward sign of the fact that we have ceased from sin. For we which have believed do not enter into rest, and he hath entered into his rest. He has also hath ceased from his own works as God did from us. He's actually quoting um, uh, the same Hebrews uh, 4, 9 right there, 4, 4, 10 right there. Will, what William is saying, what William Prescott is saying is that rest in God is a, is, is a stopping of works. It's not physical, it's spiritual, where we are focused on that relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, in Hebrews 4.11, we're going to see that rest is diligent and intentional, lest we fall into the grip of sin. And let's read 4.11. Let's see, how, see that come right out of it. Uh, Let us therefore be diligent. It's Hebrews 4, verses 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. You know, earlier I was talking about how we must exalt one another. I, I envision that's the same thing here. We, we are diligent in our rest, but we also are helping others at the same time to obey or to understand and trust in God's belief that he's going to save us. The other one is, is that the other point I want to bring up is that the rest that we do on Sabbath, this rest is, is an acknowledgement that we are saved by grace. And it's a, a story that Ellen White discusses in The Great Controversy about John Wesley, who was an English reformer. And I, I won't, I'm going to read some of it, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit because of time here. But what Will, Wesley did, and was he really worked on early in his spiritual journey, is he tried to live a totally health uh, you know, spiritual life, a life of self-denial, charity, humiliation, observing with great rigor and exactness every measure which they thought would be helpful to them in obtaining what they most desired. That holiness which could secure the favor of God. And what they found was that even when they did this, they were still always, they could never quite obtain what they sought. In vain were their endeavors to free themselves from the condemnation of sin or to break its power. In fact, Ellen White mentions, it was the same struggle that Luther had experienced in his cell in Eckford. It was the same question which is Churchard's soul. How can man be just before God? 
What, what Wesley realized to do, and later he realized that he was not saved by works, by self-piety, by charity. He was saved by grace. And here's the sentence that she says. Through long years of wearisome and comfortless strife, years of rigorous self-denial, of reproach and humiliation, Wesley had steadfastly adhered to his one purpose of seeking God. Now he had found him. He found him through grace. But he had toiled to win by prayers and fasts, by alms, alms deeds and self agnation was a gift without money or without price. This gift of salvation, of course, is without money and price. Okay. Our final rest, the other point I want to make, our final rest, of course, is going to be the new creation of Eden on the new earth. And these Sabbath rests can be thought of as a promise for that final eternal rest with God. I think that's, that's it we'll have there. And I'd like to kind of finish with some final thoughts. Please. You know, rest comes from, of course, I mentioned earlier, and we, we've talked about the belief in God's promises. It starts with that relationship with Jesus, that belief there. Also realizing that those promises, no matter how difficult they seem to us today are greater than anything we can accomplish ourselves. We, it's only something that we can achieve through faith in Jesus Christ. And also understand that the Sabbath rest is a great example of salvation by grace through our belief in Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Barbara, do you have any final thoughts? I do. <clears throat> so I wanted, my final thoughts, of course, come from Ellen White because I, I just love the way she says things. She does them so much nicer than I do. But <clears throat> Than any of us. Than any of us. <laughs> yes, amen. This is from Sons and Daughters of God. And this is, this is, this is a bit about rest as well, but it's, it's how we get to rest. So make God your entire dependence. When you mm. do otherwise, then it's time for you to halt, for you to call a halt. <laughs> halt, stop. Right where you are and change the order of things. In sincerity, in soul hunger, cry after God. Wrestle with heavenly angels until you have the victory. Put your whole being into the Lord's hands, soul, body, spirit, and resolve to be his loving, consecrated agency moved by his will. Controlled by his mind, infused by his spirit, then you will see heavenly things clearly. And what a better way to come to rest. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to read from Ellen White. Yes. Because she says it so much better than yes. we can. This is from a sermon she had in Newcastle, Australia in December 1898. The sermon was called, I Will Give You Rest. <clears throat> and it's Matthew 11:28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye who la that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here is a giving, of, or gi a giving by Christ, and on our part, <clears throat> an acceptance of the promise, a conscious finding, a sense of relief from all perplexing doubt. Simple enough, is it not? Thus it appears, but the promise is large and far-reaching. It implies much. It means deliverance from constant perplexing uncertainty. The word rest is repeated. I will give you rest. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. <clears throat> so it sounds like that rest is really a package deal. By some, the promise of God is grasped so eagerly that it becomes their own, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit is their experience. Others suppose that they must wait until they become worthy. To these, I would say, um, never, never will you become worthy. If it were possible, the Prince of Heaven need not have come to our world. <clears throat> But by taking our human nature, he declared to the heavenly universe that he united humanity to divinity in order that men and women might stand on vantage ground and be once more tested and tried. 
Through the sacrifice and merits of the Redeemer, man is made a partaker of the divine nature. And I dare even say that rest. But he must act his part by cooperating with the one who has promised. Not only does Christ say, I will give you rest, but you shall find rest into your souls. I think that would be Tuesday's lesson today. What are your choice today? The abiding rest, who has it? That rest is found when all self-justification, all reasoning from a selfish standpoint is put away. Entire self-surrender and acceptance of his, that's Christ's ways, is the secret of perfect rest in his love. We must learn his meekness and lowliness before we experience the fulfillment of the promise you will find rest into your souls. It is by learning the habits of Christ that self becomes transformed. By taking his yoke and then submitting to learn. And I love that because my burdens are heavy. But Christ's burdens are easy. I just don't want to let go of my burdens a lot of times. <laughs> And I think that's all of us at times. Yeah. Simply put, <clears throat> we'll never have that complete rest from Jesus until we completely trust him. And that would be yeah. that disbelief or that unbelief. Yeah. It is a process that takes time, a transformation. But our appeal is for all of us to start it today. And not just today, every day. Because if we don't come to the cross daily... We can lose that rest so easily. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, because there's nothing good in us. Not really. We race through this world. We try to accomplish things. We try to build things. We try to do so much on our own. We try to learn the sciences and discover your wonders without acknowledging you. And Lord, if we just surrender to you, if we just accepted you as our creator, as our savior and redeemer, and realize that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, our lives would be so much easier. Help us to remember that, Lord. Help us to know and profess that daily and to place our faith and trust in you, Lord, the only source of truth and knowledge. And Lord, teach us to trust your word. Teach us to believe in all that you say and hold fast to it, Lord, as the greatest truth that we might not only believe and trust your word, Lord, but that we might out of love obey and truly be the sons and daughters of the living God. Have that rest that Paul knew, that the apostles knew, Lord, that love for you. Lord, we pray the Holy Spirit fill every person hearing this and transform their hearts that they too may have that peace and rest in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.